All right, hello everyone. <clears throat> Good to see you out there. My name is Thomas and I do educational videos on this on this channel and um, we are in the middle of covering the reciprocal system of theory of Dewey B. Larson. It's a theory of everything that he developed back in the 20th century. Uh, he died back in 1990, but not before writing many, many books on all things such as uh, astronomy and physics and astrophysics and chemistry and economics. And we are looking at his final book uh, that actually came out after he died uh, called Beyond Space and Time. And uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, overview, uh, Larson uh, worked on his theory starting in about 1930. He had uh, certain uh, experiences that uh, uh, gave him some insights, and he developed those insights through a long period of um, of uh, inductive reasoning, uh, eventually arriving at two fundamental postulates back in the 50s, um, the first of which is the most important, uh, which is that the physical universe is composed entirely of one component, motion existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Uh, to phrase it my way, I would just say the universe is not made out of matter, it's not made out of energy, but it's made out of motion. And motion is the relationship between space and time. Space and time are the same, except that they are reciprocals of each other. One, what uh, what quality, uh, you know, uh, can be observed in one can be also uh, applied to the other. And therefore, you can extrapolate uh, into time what you already know about space, that it has three dimensions, or I would say three or four dimensions. And that uh, what you know about time, that it is progressing, also applies to space. Uh, the progression of space being the recession of the distant galaxies. And uh, they both have discrete units, uh, uh, one smallest unit of time and one uh, unit of space. And one unit of time, uh, one unit of space in one unit of time, space over time is speed. All um, and one over one one unit of space in one unit of time is the speed of light. And um, the speed of light is not the maximum speed of the universe, as Einstein would say, but it is the neutral point or the midpoint of the universe uh, and that half the universe is moving slower than the speed of light, half is moving faster than the speed of light. And um, the half that's moving slower is what we call the material sector. And the material sector contains, you know, scientific phenomena, especially, you know, like chemistry, atoms and molecules. Um, and then the, uh, but once, uh, and then the other, um, the sector two, or the cosmic sector, the, the half that's moving faster than the speed of light, is something that we don't, uh, you know, perceive directly, but we can extrapolate from our understanding of the material sector to the cosmic sector because of the reciprocal relationship between space and time. So all we have to do to go across that boundary to understand the cosmic sector is to just switch the roles of space and time. And instead of saying that something's in space, you say that it's in time, um, and so on. So anyway, the, what he gets into in, and then so he uses these, this postulate and the other, which is, is more axiomatic, as a way to uh, deductively develop the theory. You know, I've got this, uh, and if I have this, then I have that. And then if I have this, then I have that. And we went over in about 15 videos uh, just um, 
in the last month uh, over his deductive development of the reciprocal system. And he develops, you know, what a photon is, what an electron is, what an atom is, and so on. So you can go back to those videos if you uh, want to be curious about that. All that stuff really is uh, kind of occurring, except for the photon, which is kind of on the boundary uh, in the material sector. But in this book, Beyond Space and Time, he goes into the cosmic sector. And what he really says is that the material unit develops to its most complex. These are atoms and molecules, develops to its most complex. And when it gets to its most complex uh, DNA, which is like billions of atoms in a DNA molecule, then it becomes eligible to be uh, controlled by a cosmic unit uh, because there's a loss of the tra in the translation. So uh, it's not a one-to-one -one balance. It is a one-to-one -one balance. But what we see is we only see a tiny fraction of what actually is there across this boundary. And so in order to get a one-to-one, -one, you actually need billions of uh, atoms over here. And then, but once it does become under the control of the sector two unit, uh, it becomes a life unit. And so that's what life is made out of is, is the uh, balance and the control of a sector two unit over a sector one unit. Then he goes to the next level and says that once this life unit develops to its most complex level, which he says is the intelligent human being, then it can be, uh, come under the con overall control of a sector three unit. And he says sector three is the unit that's independent of space and time. Uh, and I would, I would suggest that that is the one over one level where uh, space and time are canceled out and you just get one, which is the speed of light. And uh, once it becomes under the control of the uh, sector three unit, uh, it becomes bent toward ethical experience, ethical uh, you know, uh, behavior as opposed to mere survival behavior from the sector two component. So the human being is really living in this uh, realm of uh, a kind of a tug of war between satisfying the survival motive and the ethical motive. And so right now we are looking in chapter uh, 10, which is called Revelation. And revelation for Larson is a communication, one of the kinds of communication between the sector three unit and the life unit. And uh, he goes over, we went over in the last video, several different factors which uh, you use to kind of um, evaluate your revelations because uh, the basic idea is that the revelations are always correct, but our ability to translate them correctly is limited. And so we make a lot of mistakes translating our revelations, our intuitions, our insights, our ESP into, those are all communications from sector three. Uh, but we, we have problems translating them because of various things such as wishful thinking, um, and uh, uh, we call it authoritarian bias, uh, where uh, something gives you more authority, then um, you know it has less weight as a re uh, as a uh, validity of revelation. Um, there are um, you know also he covers uh, um, anthropomorphism. Uh, you know, where you're uh, having a tendency to uh, put human characteristics on everything. And then, you know, he looks at th uh, adm admissions against interest. Uh, if something is actually against your interest, 
uh, like in a legal doctrine, if something's actually against your interest, it gives it actually more weight um, as being uh, v valid because you're going against your own interest to uh, you know, posit that revelation. So uh, after going through these different criteria of, of how to evaluate or, or uh, valid, um, to validate your um, revelations, uh, he gets down to this part right here. So I'm going to start reading from Larson right here. Application of the foregoing criteria to an evaluation of purported revelations is subject to different factors in different portions of the total field covered by religious revelations. It will therefore be helpful to begin our consideration of the kind of results that are obtained in this process by setting up a general classification of the areas that will be discussed here or in subsequent chapters um, or will be admitted from the discussion for specific reasons. So we're going to the scope of religious revelation. He has five scopes uh, or five things in the scope of religious revelation. One, existence and attributes of deity. Two, Nature and origin of existence. Uh, and those uh, as two subcategories, A, physical, B, metaphysical. And then three, purpose of existence. Four, moral, uh, moral code or ethical code. And then five, survival beyond physical death. So those are... Uh, what he, Larson says are, are covered by religious revelations. And the first item, the existence and attributes of deity, he says, the first item is one of those that we will not be able to discuss in this work as no pertinent information with respect to the subject has been developed in our investigation nor has it been possible to verify any of the revelations that are claimed to have been received on this matter. These alleged revelations are plentiful, but they are so conflicting that it is not possible, as matters now stand, to apply the criteria of validity that we have derived. So, um, this is, uh, as far as I know, really the only thing that is outside of the purview of the reciprocal system, uh, that the reciprocal system can't penetrate and come up with uh, valid answers for, is the existence and attributes of deity. Now remember, um, when Larson says sector three, uh, he really is referring to God. Okay, he calls it sector three. Uh, being the scientist that he is, and uh, so, but he's saying that the the reciprocal system has no information, uh, uh, val valid information about the existence or the attributes of deity. Now he goes to item two a, which is the nature and origin of existence in the physical universe. Turning to item 2a, we find that most organized religions have explanations of the origin and nature of the physical universe, which are claimed to have been received through revelation. These and many other religious assertions about physical matters are generally wrong, in whole or in part, and the manner in which the advance of scientific knowledge has demolished one after another of these uh, so-called revealed truths has been a major factor in weakening the influence of religion in our present day society. Um, but the position of religion with respect to scientific knowledge and its position with respect to moral principles and other matters of a non-physical nature are altogether different. It could not be expected that the revelations which religion claims to have received concerning any but relatively simple scientific matters would be correct. 
since the individuals who presumably received the revelations did not have the background of scientific knowledge that would have enabled them to understand what was being received and to express it in comprehensible terms, uh, even if the revelations were complete and accurate. Uh, now, remember uh, from a recent episode, we were talking about this, that when you receive uh, something from sector three, a communication could be intuition, scientific insight, religious revelation. Um, they, they can be more general or more specific. The more general he call, he classifies that as intuition. And that's something that's any lay person, um, who it, you know, is just a conscientious person, uh, can receive a, an intuition, um, you know, like a gut feeling about something and that it, it can be valid. Uh, because it's generally applied. But a scientific insight or a religious revelation requires a, a higher standard to be able to kind of accurately translate that. You have to, you know, really kind of study the matter. You have to study the background information because the communication that you're going to receive is going to be sufficiently complex that you're not going to understand it unless you have that background information. You have to kind of stand on the shoulders of a few things uh, before you can see far enough to be able to translate that. It's coming to you in, in um, more complicated language. Uh, and if you don't have the training, the, your, the, the intuition or the insight or the revelation is going to pass you by. Or you're not going to be able to understand it or translate it properly. So that's what he's talking about here. Um. And I think he goes on a little bit further. The knowledge required for this purpose was not even in existence from the human standpoint at the time the revelations that underlie the major religions were said to have been received. No doubt many of the individuals concerned were wholly sincere in their accounts of what they thought had been revealed to them, but it is obvious that they could not have understood the message no matter how complete or how distinct it may have been nor did they have any language in which they could have expressed this knowledge intelligibly if they had somehow acquired an understanding of it. For these reasons, it is unlikely that religious revelations have had or will have anything of consequence to contribute either in the inanimate realm, level one, or the biological world, level two. So really chemistry or biology physics, chemistry, and biology. These levels are readily accessible to scientific investigation and the methods of science, methods that are indigenous to the physical universe, can be more effectively used by the human beings who are inhabitants of that universe for the purpose of investigating it than the methods of sector three, which are at least for the present imperfectly understood and not subject to conscious direction. So he's, I think he, what he's really saying is that revelation is not nearly as effective as scientific investigation if your purview is the inanimate uh, and the biological. You know, when you're talking about sector one and sector two, then you might as well stick with the scientific uh, pursuits. The revelations that you're going to get are not going to be specific. Uh, they're going to be they're going to be kind of like over your head. Um, that seems to be a little bit of a contradiction because if you are engaging in scientific pursuits, you would think that you're doing enough studying to be able to translate the revelations properly, but. Uh, maybe he addresses that later on here. Much of the information about these two lower levels uh, coming from religious sources, like the revelations regarding the nature and origin of the universe, erroneous, and that is, uh, is erroneous, 
and that which is correct can in most instances be found in more complete form in the results of scientific investigations. Indeed, the real meaning of revelations concerning the physical universe often comes to light only after science has discovered the truth, simply because the human race was not prepared to understand this real meaning without the help of additional information. Um, in terms of the discussion of the preceding chapter, the platform, or like I said, the shoulders that you're standing on, the platform provided by the then existing store of knowledge was not yet high enough. For example, the account of creation in the first chapter of Genesis has not received its just due as a physical revelation, even to this day, primarily because of a misunderstanding as to the subject of its message, a misunderstanding that has resulted from concentrating attention on the manner of presentation rather than on the information that is given. Each statement in the account is made in the form, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Specifically, therefore, the story seems to be one of direct creation of the universe ex nihilo, out of nothing, in a manner that is either miraculous or fanciful, de depending on the viewpoint. Okay, so that's pretty much all we have time for right now, but next time we're going to go into uh, his assertions here about Genesis and what it's really about, Genesis 1 chapter 1, and uh, what it's about and how it is a, um, a scientific uh, revelation, but that hasn't been translated uh, correctly. Okay, uh, have a great day, and we'll, hopefully we'll see you next time.